Hello, you beautiful people. With how much we talk about Darwin and his theory of evolution, you'd think we'd be past the point of thinking that Darwin is the king of evolutionary thought. He's probably rolling in his grave right now asking why creationists keep bringing up his name, as if his opinion on the theory is the only thing that gives it any weight. Did you know that Charles Darwin knew about the key issue in his theory that doesn't add up? Did you know that he was troubled by the fact that an entire field of scientific study opposes the key tenets of evolution? Yes, he sure was, and although he was hoping that future discoveries would fix his problem, the evidence that emerged shattered that hope into a thousand pieces. Yep, that's exactly what I mean. For some reason, creationists are always thinking, oh, if we show them that Darwin doubted his own theory, then that's the ultimate blow we can deal to the theory of evolution. But really, that's not the case, and I always say this in my videos. It doesn't matter now what Darwin thought. He could have secretly rejected his idea entirely from the bottom of his heart, and that wouldn't matter at all. Because science isn't built upon the beliefs of one person. It's built upon the scientific community as a whole, and the concept of the scientific consensus. Modern scientists have taken what Darwin began and vastly improved and expanded upon it. What we know now as evolution is very, very different than Darwin's original image of it, so much so that he himself is just one scientist amongst a sea of others. Does it really matter what he thought about evolution, even though he was the first person to propose the idea? Because we have taken his theory and it no longer belongs to him, it belongs to the entire body of the scientific community. Its validity stands upon the peak of over a century's worth of scientific thinking. Disproving one individual scientist who lived in the past isn't going to change what evolution is worth. Darwin's hypothesis begins with the craft of pigeon breeding. Don't get me wrong, his pigeon breeding was very important, but I wouldn't say it's where the hypothesis began. More so, I would refer to the finches that Darwin observed, but I guess it depends on how you define begin. He observed that by carefully selecting from within a given set of pigeons, specific pigeons with certain characteristics, breeders are able to create a new set of pigeons. Depending on the goal and selection of the breeder, the newly bred set of pigeons would differ in overall size, color or size of wings from the original set. Yep, Darwin had a pretty big obsession with pigeon breeding. He bred pigeons in many ways and showed how certain traits can be passed down from one generation to the next. While Darwin's finches are more famous, his pigeons are nothing to be laughed at. This guy was obsessed with birds. Based on that, Darwin suggested that nature was vested with the same creative powers as the breeder. Namely, it would select those features in animals that are useful in the struggle for survival. This is why he said that I have called this principle by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection in order to mark its relation to man's power of selection. And so Darwin's hypothesis in the origin of species was essentially this. Starting from one common ancestor, all life forms evolved slowly and gradually over long periods of time as random mutation would bring up new traits from which natural selection would preserve or select the ones that are useful for survival. Wow, I don't think there's a single creationist out there that has ever gotten this concept correct, so kudos to you. Yes, natural selection itself does not include new traits. Rather, it is just one mechanism out of many that drives the transformation of populations and species. While yes, mutations most likely have either silent or detrimental effects, natural selection works with it in order to preserve just the ones that are beneficial. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's his pigeon study specifically that drove this thought, but he was indeed able to bring certain mutations to future generations through his breeding patterns. Creationists most often have the most trouble understanding this concept, so it's somewhat refreshing to see one that at least has a basic understanding of evolutionary mechanisms. Accordingly, his theory predicted that the gradual development of species would be reflected in the geological record with an endless array of transitional fossilized animal forms, which would allow paleontologists and biologists to trace the tiny steps biological organisms took in evolving from one species into the next. Paleontology was a field that already existed during Darwin's time, but it wasn't nearly as established as it is today. In fact, many of the fossils were even identified incorrectly, and there were no real good attempts at piecing it all together. Darwin himself even dug up his own fossils, and while he mislabeled a lot of them, wondered why many of them resembled animals we currently see today. It was a common thought back then that fossils were not just dead animals, but also extinction events, which can be misleading, especially considering the commonly accepted thought of gradual changes in populations and species we have today. This led Darwin to briefly suggest that species made certain evolutionary jumps, where new species arose from old ones. But eventually his thinking changed and instead produced a more gradual model, closer to Darwin's theory as we know in modern times. But anyway, I'm sure this creationist is about to go on about how paleontology debunked Darwin and that Darwin supposedly knew about it anyway. 
Yet at the same time, when he published The Origin of Species in 1859, paleontologists had bad news for him. The fossil record showed very clearly that new species appear suddenly and abruptly and not by evolving in small step-by-step -step fashion over long periods of time. This person is trying to make you believe that A, the fossil record rejected Darwin's idea, and B, that the understanding of the fossil record at the time was complete. Neither of these are true. In fact, when Darwin proposed his idea, the fossil record was largely incomplete and any evidence he pulled from paleontology was based on gaps at the time. Furthermore, Darwin convinced many, many paleontologists to evolutionary thought, not necessarily his theory of evolution by the way, which was definitely not a popular idea at the time. With incompleteness of the fossil record, paleontologists really didn't have a consensus and as a result did not have any uniform grounds to necessarily reject Darwin's hypothesis. That's why Darwin's work was so revolutionary, because it didn't just change the way we viewed the evolution of species but also the fossil record. For this reason, the most prominent paleontologists at Darwin's time rejected his theory. Okay, but who cares? Like I said earlier, it doesn't matter what a few scientists thought in the past. What matters is what the idea is today and how much evidence there is to back it up. The issue was not that there were some minor inconsistencies here and there between Darwin's theory and the fossil record. No. It was that the science of paleontology as a whole and everything paleontologists knew presented a picture that was diametrically opposed to the one Darwin tried to paint. That's just a straight up lie. Sorry, not sure how to sugarcoat that at all. Again, he's making it sound like the field of paleontology was well established at the time with its own conclusions drawn from the fossil record that has been solidified, but that's just simply not the case. It was an infant field that was molded by Darwin's evolutionary thought process. It'd be nice if he could give us some specific examples if he truly believes that the field of paleontology opposed Darwin's theory of evolution, but that's asking too much from a creationist. Darwin himself was painstakingly aware of that, and he expressed his discomfort repeatedly in his book. Like here, for example, as according to the theory of natural selection, an interminable number of intermediate forms must have existed. Why is not every geological formation charged with such links? Like I said, a lot of Darwin's work revolved around certain branches of the fossil record that was not well established. It's easy to look at fossils and think it was a whole creature rather than an intermediate, but that's actually what all life is right now. Even now, we're currently in the middle of a transition. Every life form is an intermediate life form, but the fossil record, being as infant as it was at the time, had a lot of gaps, so it's more difficult to see such links, especially if you look at one species at a time. I don't blame Darwin for not knowing everything about his own theory. When we come up with new hypotheses all the time, especially in the past, the first scientist to propose the idea isn't ultimately going to be the most knowledgeable. If we look at any scientific figure in the past, be it Einstein, Newton, or Darwin, we know a lot more now than they ever did in their lifetimes, even if they were the creator of such theories. That's why debunking one person who lived in the past isn't going to debunk the entire field. You'll have to get through the entire mountain that is the modern scientific consensus. So Darwin asserted that paleontologists simply hadn't unearthed yet the interminable number of intermediate forms his theory predicted to exist, hoping that the future of paleontology would change that and vindicate him. In other words, he was essentially making an argument from silence and explained away the absence of evidence instead of explaining the evidence scientists were actually facing. That is, the fact of new animal forms showing up suddenly and abruptly in the fossil record rather than gradually. If Darwin really thought that, which I don't know if he did or not since I can't trust creationists at all when it comes to quoting people, then he was kind of spot on. Sure, we have certain events like the Cambrian explosion which gave rise to a large number of animal phyla seemingly at once. But for the vast, vast majority of the fossil record, it's not like that, and the Cambrian explosion has good explanations. For example, there were many drastic environmental changes that could have led to the rise of many animals, such as the rapid increase in oxygen content and the formation of the ozone layer, all being favorable to animal creatures and would explain the rapid development of the animal kingdom. There really wasn't a time in history where we observed a rapid generation of fossils, especially not one that we cannot explain. So no, not only have you misrepresented the findings of paleontology in the past, you've also misrepresented what we know about it in the present. Had you lived at the time of Darwin and were excited about his theory, you might have joined him in hoping that those innumerable intermediate forms in the fossil record would be unearthed later on. Have these hopes come true? Nope. Lies, lies, and more lies. It's also hilarious when people use science to disprove science. Creationists need to realize that all fields of natural science are for the most part in harmony. Greatly accepted ideas do not contradict each other, so it's futile to try to convince people that they do. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and thank you to the usual awesome people of Patreon, Fireshard, Ellen Morton, Ms. Fixit, and Edward Martin. 
Let's keep debunking more pseudoscience on the internet, so I hope you'll join me in the upcoming weeks as well. Stay safe and I'll see you later.